choosing colours for your watercolour palette. Today we're going to look at 10 of my more unusual choices. Welcome back to my channel. If we haven't met before, my name is Michelle. On this channel you'll find all things watercolour as well as a bit of mixed media, painting, drawing, tuition and colour mixing videos like this one. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon you can get notified each time I have a new video for you. So one thing that often happens to me when I am walking around a painting class is that beginners will ask me to identify colours. Not necessarily tube paints because of course you can read those but the little pans, the little um, block paints that you get, they'll ask me and they'll, they'll point to a light blue and say well what's this colour? I say well that's cerulean blue. What's this dark yellow? Well that's yellow ochre. And although it's quite impressive to them that I know this, it's pretty easy for me because they always put the same colours in beginner's sets. If you've got a light blue, it's almost certain to be cerulean blue. If you've got a dark blue, it's almost certain to be ultramarine or perhaps cobalt. So in this video, I thought I'd do something a bit more interesting. I thought I'd show you some of the more unusual colour choices. These are not essential paints and they're not things that you definitely need. However, if you are a certain type of painter, you know, if you perhaps... If you have trouble mixing really natural looking greens or interesting greens, then perhaps you'd like to hear about um, a really beautiful green that's in my palette. If you are into botanicals and florals, you probably need a lot more pinks and a lot more purples than the average watercolour painter. Perhaps you paint fantasy paintings and you're interested in something a little bit sparkly. So I've got 10 unusual colours for you here. I'm going to swatch them all and talk about what you might use them for in your own work. Now I have linked to all of these um, down below. One or two of them are British brands but you should be able to buy them internationally nevertheless. So I'll put all the links in the video description so just click the down arrow or it might say see more. You'll be able to read all about those colours. Now the links in the description are affiliate links so just be aware that if you do click any of those links I get a small commission but you do not pay it. So let's talk about each of these colours individually. I'm also going to swatch them for you and talk about what I think you'll find them most useful for. So first up we have a Talon's Rembrandt colour. It's a colour that I often find it hard to remember what it's called because there's just so many words in it. So I'm going to read it and it's Permanent Madder Lake Brown. Permanent Madder Lake Brown. It's the most stunning, unusual, beautiful colour. So let's look at that one first. Now the reason I like this colour I think is because it almost defies description so I keep it here sort of at the end I've got pinks and then I've got scarlets and then I've got this sort of um, madder type colours then I'm going into sort of these uh, these warm orangey colours and I keep it here but equally I could keep it with the earth colours I could keep it with the warm reds I mean there's um, things like Venetian red I, I can't even place it it's not a madder it's not a pink it's certainly not as dull as one of those um, those oxide reds or Venetian reds, and it's not quite a brown. So let's have a look at it. Now, when you put it on full strength, it almost appears a dark red. But then if we water it down, you can see why they call it brown as well. It's a very vibrant colour. I think actually very, very useful for painting things like um, autumn leaves with a little bit of adjustment. I haven't actually found a use and a place for it in my palette yet, but I just love it so much. I just think it's the most beautiful, beautiful colour. It's not an orange. It's not a red. It's not even a dark pink. I don't know what it is, but it's really, really beautiful. Let's have a look at it just a little bit more watered down. A really beautiful, interesting colour. Next up we have another Talons Rembrandt colour and this one is sepia. Now you'll notice there's some duct tape around this and that's because the other day there was, I found a little hole in it. I didn't know it was a hole, I thought it was just a little speck of paint and I was being very thick and I was sort of wiping it away and wiping it away and eventually I realised there was actually a hole in the tube, a tiny sort of pierced hole and um, so I grabbed some duct tape from the garage and it worked pretty well actually so if you've got a tube that's leaking duct tape's the thing. Sepia is a colour that I use again and again, so let's look at why. If you have a beginner's palette, you probably have something like Burnt Umber. It's this colour here. It's a really rich, warm, 
dark brown. It's not quite a staining colour, um, it's an earth colour, but it's a strong colour nonetheless. And people tend to use it for if they're painting earth or if they're painting tree trunks. But the problem I have as someone who's a fairly realistic watercolourist is that tree trunks and, and earth, certainly in the UK, they really aren't this rich red brown colour. They're a much um, darker, much colder colour. So that's why I like this colour. This is Talon's Rembrandt Sepia. It's incredibly strong and dark and quite cool with almost a yellowish tone to it. Now this is what they call a mixed pigment colour, which means that each manufacturer, you know, if you asked a dozen people what, um, what, what colour sepia was, you know, some would say it's a yellowish brown, some might say, well, it's sort of a greyish colour. There's no exact idea of what sepia is in the minds of people, um, certainly not in the minds of artists or in paint manufacturers. But this one here, this Talon's Rembrandt one, is a cold, dark brown. Now, if you water it right the way down, you've got a colour that's incredibly useful for painting things like driftwood. You can cool it down even further by putting a little bit of grey in it, a little bit of blue in it. So one of the most useful colours in my box, sepia. Now, if you ever ask me my favourite colour, I'll probably tell you Cerulean Blue and I'll probably tell you the Talon's Rembrandt Cerulean Blue. But I discovered another colour recently, which I'm also rather in love with, and it's this one. It's Daniel Smith Manganese Blue Hue. I just want to talk briefly about pigment numbers at this point as well. Now, many of you have asked me to tell you the pigment numbers of paints. The problem with this particular video is that I have multiple brands. Some of them don't include them on the tube. And some of them are mixed pigment colours, so they have multiple, you know, four, five or even more pigments in them. So it would be very difficult to do. If I'm ever comparing um, single pigment colours like ultramarine blues, I certainly will talk about pigment numbers. I'm actually considering on my website swatching all the colours I have and listing all the pigment numbers. I know some artists do that and their websites are very popular because people find it really really useful to see those colours so let me know if that's something that you would find useful too. Now manganese blue. So cerulean blue is a beautiful beautiful colour and I have a whole video on it which I will link to above. It's a single pigment colour made from um, one pigment or another pigment. There's, there's two that they tend to make it from. The manufacturers tend to choose one or the other. Now this is Daniel Smith Manganese Blue Hue and you can see it's very similar to Cerulean but it's just got a lot more punch to it. It's a lot brighter and it's a colour that I have been really enjoying using in skies lately. So let's water it right down. Very similar to Cerulean in that it granulates and it's fairly weak but still much much brighter than a standard Cerulean. I find it a really, really useful colour in my box, particularly for skies. Now, lemon yellow is an absolute staple in every watercolour palette. However, I'm also very fond of this. This is um, a British company called the SAA, and this is Primrose Yellow. So we're going to talk about that one next. So lemon yellow is really useful, but it can be very acid and very greenish. Now, this is, um, this is a British brand. And this is primrose yellow. Now, there are times when you're painting these very, very pale yellows, particularly, I mean, it's called primrose yellow, and it's exactly the colour that it is when you're painting those primrose type, um, type flowers. I also really like this one. If you've got that sort of flash of a yellow field in the distance, I like it for that as well. It's very, very cool. It's fairly bright. It's very opaque. I mean, almost to the point of being a gouache, it's opaque. Now, people are very scared of opaque paints and they tend to have this idea that only um, transparent colours will make your watercolours glow. If only um, fixing muddy paintings were as simple as just avoiding opaque colours, there wouldn't be any muddy paintings in the world. It's actually a video I'm going to do on the causes of muddy paintings. Now certainly if you get an opaque colour like this and mix it into every single colour you put on your painting, you could have problems. But to use it just in one place for some flowers, or like I said, for that flash of pale yellow in the horizon, 
it's a really, really beautiful colour and it doesn't have that acidity of a pure lemon yellow. Now, if you find a grey in your beginner's palette, it's most likely to be Payne's Grey, a really useful, strong, dark blue grey. I've actually got a video that I made especially about it. I'll link to that one above, fabulous colour. However, have you heard of Davies Grey? This is Winsor & Newton Davies Grey, and we're gonna talk about that one next. So if you have Payne's Grey, you will know that it's a very strong blue staining colour, a colour that is um, quite fresh looking and almost as dark as black. It can even look blacker than black if you apply it strongly. Now, Davies Grey is almost its polar opposite. It's a rather weak colour. It's not blue-based at all. In fact, it's far more greenish. It's slightly opaque, slightly granular. And you can see here, I'm applying it, it's quite weak. Now, although it could be used for things like um, Concrete would definitely be a good colour for concrete slabs and pathways. It's actually more widely used by botanical artists. So if you like painting flowers and you've got white flowers and you want that shadow on the flowers without making them look sort of dead and going into earth colours, this can be a fabulous, fabulous soft grey because often Payne's grey is just too strong and too harsh for botanical work. I tend to mix my own greys but also this is a very good alternative, a pale, granular, green-based grey that's very, very delicate. This is Davies Grey. At this point, could I ask you to do me a really quick favour? If you're enjoying this video and getting some value from it, could you just click the like button? Videos do really well on YouTube if they have interaction with their audience. In other words, if you like or share or leave me a comment, it'll do better on YouTube and I'll be so grateful because it helps my little channel to grow. For many years, I didn't own any pre-mixed greens. I made all of my greens from blue and yellow, and it's a fabulous thing to do if you're a beginner because it will really teach you about color mixing. However, by hook or by crook, and often by accident, I ended up with lots of tube greens as well. This is one of my favorite, Daniel Smith Green Gold. So watercolor tutors like me often have trouble with beginners and tube greens and ready-made greens because the greens that they put in beginner's sets for some reason are always those really bright greens. They are the viridians and the emerald greens and I do understand from a color mixing point of view those are very adjustable greens. I'm going to do a video coming up on how to adjust these viridian and emerald greens and make them into useful greens but the problem is that often beginners don't understand how to do that and so they chuck this particular bright green into everything and end up with a very sort of bright day glow landscape. So if we can find some ready mixed greens that are more interesting and not too um, unnatural, then that's useful. This one's one of my favorites. It is very bright, but it's also rather natural looking. It would be said to be probably a lime green. It almost, when you look at it on the paper, it almost separates. I mean, it, it doesn't physically separate, but you almost feel you can very, very strongly see the yellow in it. And most greens, if you mix them yourself, you'll find that you start with yellow, you put the tiniest amount of blue in, and it tips them over to, uh, to green. So most greens are mostly yellow anyway, and this one in particular, is this beautiful, warm yellow transparency to it. So. If you just you know, if you just can't get your head around color mixing, you're really bad at mixing greens. This is one that you can add to your collection. It is very bright. You will need to use it sparingly, but again, hugely adjustable. You could put darker blues in it, like um, um, ultramarine, for instance, and get more natural dark greens too. It's a beautiful, stunning color. Fabulous for painting those really fresh greens that you get in nature. Daniel Smith, Green Gold. Many people keep a permanent rose in their palette. I like this one. This is not permanent rose. This is Talon's Rembrandt Quinacridone Rose. Now, although I'm calling this color unusual, it's only unusual perhaps to some of the people watching the video. It's not unusual to me. It's an absolute staple in my palette. Slightly more on the blue side than some permanent roses. It's a lovely transparent pink. A Barbie pink if you will a blue based pink now at the end of, uh, of this video I'm actually going to link on the end screen I'm going to link to a video that I did 
all about this colour and why I feel that every um, every beginner's palette, every watercolourist palette should include a cool blue based pink. You cannot, for example, mix a uh, an effective purple without a blue based pink. If you've ever tried to mix a really lovely purple from something like a scarlet red and just ended up with something very murky, you'll understand what I mean. But there's far more uses for this colour than just that. Of course it's fabulous for flower painting. But because it's um, it's a primary colour in that it's red essentially and it's cool, it means it has multiple uses, particularly for mixing greys, for mixing skin tones. I mean the cooler skin tones like my own, not necessarily as useful for mixing warm skin tones or Indian African skin tones, but for ca Caucasian skin tones, incredibly useful. Also for um, just for those neutral colours like those sort of beiges and creams and things that you don't really quite know how to mix, you'll be amazed to find that this will help you with that. It's also incredibly good for neutralising strong greens. I'll put that video at the end. Do have a look at it. One of the most useful colours I have, Quinacridone Rose. Next is a really interesting colour that I thought was only available to oil painters and perhaps acrylic painters, but no, Daniel Smith have made a version in watercolour. This is Buff Titanium. Now the reason Buff Titanium isn't much found in watercolour palettes is because by nature these sort of cream type colours are majority white pigment. I haven't looked at the exact pigment makeup, but of course it's rather opaque as I would expect from a colour like this. But nevertheless, look at that, very useful. I can't say I've used it a huge amount in my own paintings yet, but if you struggle with making things like creams with those, um, those paler skin tones that we were talking about, things like pathways, I think you might find this colour quite useful. It's almost between a cream and a beige. As I said, not a colour you frequently see in watercolours because of the amount of opacity in it, but I don't mind the odd opaque colour in my palette. As I mentioned earlier, they're not a problem as long as you don't let them mix with every other part of your painting. So watering it down there, you can see a really unusual and really quite useful colour. Perhaps you own a purple in your box, a real strong sort of royal purple, something like a permanent blue violet. This one's a bit different. This is Windsor & Newton Perylene Violet. Now for years when I started painting, I didn't own any secondary colours. I didn't own any greens, any oranges or any purples. I prided myself in mixing all of those from the primary colours and um, it really, really helped me to understand about colour mixing. The first secondary colour I ever got was by accident actually. Um, I was at a class I used to attend with another teacher, a botanical artist, um, a chap who has probably spent more time teaching me to paint than anyone else, um, a British botanical tutor, and he actually gave me a squeeze of permanent blue violet in my, uh, in my paint palette. I, I was struggling to mix a purple that wasn't granular, and he gave me this squeeze of permanent blue violet and I was astonished the thing lasted for months. I mean literally a year later I still had this pet colour on my palette because it was so strong. Eventually it ran out and I realised how much I liked it and I replaced it. So when I was setting up my palettes I, I looked at this permanent blue violet, such a blue based purple and I wondered to myself was there more of a red based violet and then I found this. So this is Perylene Violet. So if you imagine a royal purple, well this is quite the opposite. This is a beautiful shade of plum. Absolutely amazing for painting um, botanicals and fruits in particular. And it, it literally is the colour of a plum. It's a really, really lovely colour. And if you are into painting botanical paintings, fruits, still lifes, things like that, you may find this a useful colour to have. It's also really good if you're painting sunsets and you've got sort of um, trees and things highlighted against the sunset. I never use black. I always look for those strong, strong darks. This is a fabulous colour for that as well. So if I water it down, you can see it's much more muted than a ordinary violet would be. But it's a really, really interesting colour. So if you're into painting sunsets or if you're into painting fruit, and flowers you might like perylene violet. 
lastly for you today because I can't resist a bit of sparkle and the name really doesn't do this one justice because black doesn't begin to describe it. This is Cosmic Black Shimmer. I've got a little sample pot here from Jackman's Art Materials. Just before I swatch this last colour, let me talk very briefly about paper. Lots of you are asking what paper I'm painting on. If I'm painting on a loose sheet like this, it's just practice paper. So this is by the SAA, perfectly good standard practice paper that I sell to my students and use for anything like demonstrating or colour swatching. If you see me painting on a board of stretched paper, then it will be Saunders Waterford High White. That's made by St Cuthbert's Mill. I have the, uh, the £140 weight because I'm working with it stretched, so it doesn't need to be a very, very heavy weight. I know some people swear by things like Arsh's paper. It's not to my taste. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, uh, it's, it's an incredibly good paper, actually, but um, I don't really enjoy painting on it for some reason. I like the Saunders Waterford High White, so that's the one that I tend to stick to. Years ago, I used to use Bockingford, which is kind of the cheaper version by, by St Cuthbert's Mill. I found that it got a little bit smooth for me, so I just like to paint on this standard version. I very rarely go to a hot pressed paper, not even for botanical work. There are all sorts of problems with painting on hot pressed paper. It's not an easy surface to work on. So I tend to avoid that unless I'm doing something. I've got a course I'm doing at the moment, an online course, where I'm doing some mixed media stuff. So we're painting with watercolours and we're adding in things like charcoal. In that case, I do need a fully smooth surface, so I go to a hot pressed paper. But if I can avoid it, I'll stick with the not surface, with the cold pressed. So I'm going to swatch the, uh, the Jackman's Art Cosmic Black Shimmer on a separate piece of paper so I can hold it a bit closer to the camera because the shimmer is, uh, is very subtle and these things tend to be hard to show on camera. It's called black, but actually once it's watered down, it's a very lovely soft grey. So it does go quite dark there. But if I water it down, we can get it much softer. They remind me, these shimmer paints, a little bit of the Daniel Smith Iridescence. They have got a whole range of these shimmer colours. And although the video is not sponsored, I do have a discount code. So if you have a look in the uh, in the video description, you'll find 10% off of Jackman's Art Materials. I'm going to put that really close to the camera, see if you can see it. I've also got one here that dried earlier. Sometimes it's a little bit easier to see the shimmer after these paints have dried. So hopefully you can see there's little, little glittery bits in there. They do other colours like gold and I think they've actually bought out some kind of pink champagne at the moment which looks absolutely stunning. So do take advantage of that discount code if you would like to. As well as the shimmer paints they have other colours um, that are non-shimmer and they also have a nice range of synthetic brushes too. So that's the Jackman's Art Cosmic Black Shimmer. So do let me know in the comments if you have tried any of these colours or if you're going to give them a try now. I'd also be really interested in hearing about the unusual colours that you like. I could have made this video three times over with all the colours that I have in my collection. So do let me know if you found this video useful and I'll make more videos like it. I'm also going to make a video of really basic colour selection coming up. So if this has been a little bit advanced for you, you just want those really, really basic colours and colour mixes to start off with. I'm going to have lots of videos like that coming up too. So do remember to subscribe to the channel. It's free. Earlier in this video, we looked at one of the most useful colours I have in my palette, Quinacridone Pink. And I mentioned that I have a whole video that tells you exactly why a cool blue based pink is one of the most useful colours you can add to your watercolour mixing palette. You can watch that video right now.